Right, good evening all. We will just start, I'll just talk you through the, the logistics of all this this evening. Um, some of you are well used to these webinars now. This is the fourth we've done in, in this series. Um, as you'll see on your screen, there is a Q&A box at the bottom, which feel free to put questions in there. There are no bad questions. So if you've got something you'd like to know, please type them in there and then we will um, pick them up as we go through the evening. Or if we haven't, we will pick them up at the end. So any Q&As, please feel free to put them in that box there. And we can see you or hear you. So you can sit at home and lunch your dinner and relax um, and listen, let this um, absorb into you or wash over whichever you want. But we're delighted to have you come on board. And um, we are recording the session this evening as we normally do, um, and it will be sent to everybody that have registered. Um, so some of you, some people that aren't on the call tonight, they will still get it and you will as well if you're on it. So, so great pleasure to welcome Suzanne um, to us, Suzanne's uh, morning, Friday morning in New Zealand. Um, so we're, we're delighted to have her here, um, one of the real um, pioneers of this whole approach. And actually, Suzanne and the team in New Zealand won lots of awards on the innovation associated with um, the methane work that they've done. But I'll let you, I'll let Suzanne um, describe all that to you in her usual modest way. But um, I'm not going to dwell too much. We're, we're going to um, just crack on with Suzanne speaking and we will um, deal with questions as we go. Suzanne, over to you. Thanks, Dari. Right, we'll see if we can get this up and running. Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see that. Dari, can you? No, it hasn't come up yet, Suzanne. Okay. Let's try again. Just check. Oh, it still hasn't come for some reason. No, it's disappeared. It's all right. We'll go again. <laughs> There's a bit there. I'm assuming Lori hasn't disabled anything. I'd say not. I'd say it's this end. Bear with me. Okay. So we'll close that. Let's have another go at it. Yeah. So obviously, this is a hot topic area for everybody right now. So um, it certainly is. It's one that's extremely important in New Zealand, and one that we've been working on for ten years. So um, yeah, it's um, it's extremely difficult to to work on um, an area when there when there is no no real interest and no real funding, but. Um, we, you know, we we anticipated that 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 it would come, and uh, and it certainly has. So um, we are um, very grateful that we started when we did, because if you don't start early enough, then you know you're always chasing. So um, yeah, we we're actually really pleased that 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 we did what we did, and um, that that we're basically ready to go. Right, I'm going to try this again. I think basically what happened was... Um, there we go. It's coming up now, Suzanne. It's not on presenter yet, but it will be, I think. Yeah, it's a bit slow. It's probably... Probably got lots of data in the, in the computer. There we <laughs> it's go. It's probably a bit bit hefty. How, how, how's that? Is that looking better? And it's all good. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, thanks everyone. And thanks everyone for, for giving up your evening. Um, it's still summer here and it's a it's a bright and sunny Friday morning, but I realize for you guys that you've probably just come in for a long day in the cold and uh, you're uh, more more than happy to, to sit in a chair and, and eat your dinner. But um, yeah, thanks. Thank, thanks for joining and, and, and listening and giving me the opportunity to, to chat to you. Um, I'm going to talk about breeding sheep with a lower carbon footprint. It's a research program that's been going here for 10 years, uh, started by a man called John McEwen, um, and I inherited it about eight years ago. Um, just a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm an animal breeder. Uh, uh, a quantitative geneticist is, 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 is the fancy term. Um, I started out in farming, um, breeding horses, uh, breeding dairy cows, uh, worked in Africa, growing tobacco and, and, and hand milking cows. So, so I have a, a practical background, but I did a master's 
um, at the the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm I'm from Devon, so um, I'm British. Don't hold it against me. Um, I did a, a PhD in, in quantitative genetics and animal and human uh, genetics at, at the Roslyn Institute in Scotland. Um, I did a degree in agriculture at Silhane University, uh, which I, I'm sure, or Silhane College, which sadly has, has gone by the way now, but I'm, I'm sure many of you have had the pleasure of going there. And I've, I've ended up here in New Zealand. Um, I've spent the last 10 years uh, at Invermay. So that's the top left on this, on this picture. Uh, it's a farm in the, in the south of New Zealand. I work for Ag Research, which is a government research institute. We've got four campuses across New Zealand. Um, and happily ensconced here looking at breeding programs for uh, ruminant livestock so that's sheep cattle and deer but mostly in the sheep space and I have to say for most of the last 10 years it's been looking at um, methane and, and, and breeding for, for a lower carbon footprint. So I'll talk a little bit about the challenge that we face in New Zealand, um, the research program that we have in sheep, how it's been rolled out to industry, what we think the impact will be of the, of, of, of the research and the rollout to industry um, and we're always moving forward. There's always something to do. So, so future work and, and, and what we're up to next. So the size of the problem in New Zealand, um, greenhouse gases in New Zealand uh, are dominated by agriculture. So 50% of all of the greenhouse gases that are produced come from agriculture and 80% of that comes from methane, enteric methane that's belched out by grazing animals. So that means a third of all of the greenhouse gases in New Zealand are attributed to grazing stock. Um, that puts the onus on the agricultural sector. So New Zealand has signed the, the Paris Agreement. That's an agreement that was signed by 194 countries and the countries came together and they agree collectively to set targets in their own countries that would limit warming to one and a half to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So it doesn't matter the size of the country, doesn't matter who they are, they're all going to do their bit was basically the, the collective agreement. And New Zealand agreed for net zero emissions by 2050, or well, that's the target that they've set to achieve that goal. Um, but they've left out biogenic methane and they've left out biogenic methane because it's really, really hard. It's uncertain, we've got grazing livestock, we don't know how we're gonna do it. So our targets here in New Zealand are, we must reduce the methane coming from our stock by 10% by 2030 and 24 to 47% by 2050. Now that seems like a really wide gap, but basically if we get no other technologies coming on board and nothing to help us, the 24% will be our target. But if a, if a really clever technology shows up in the next 20 years that really helps us to move forward, then the target will move to more like 47 or 50%. So that, that's, that's what we're faced with in the sector. Those targets have been set for us. We know what we have to achieve. Warming is undoubtedly happening. Um, you know, we know that it's, it's absolutely irrefutable. And, and that's the reason that these targets have been set. So we know that. And in farming, we've just been hit really, really hard in New Zealand. This is, these are photographs uh, from real footage just two weeks ago in New Zealand. We've had an enormous storm here. Uh, it, it hit the top of uh, New Zealand. So um, right up in the north and it came down the east coast and it absolutely wiped out. Um, most of our eastern seaboard so um, we, we we've had big issues here and, and in the south we're in drought so um, you know certainly the government is sitting up and, and, and taking notice because agriculture is being hit hardest by by these climate changes oh hang on got something going on there that's um Somebody else has obviously used these slides and, and, and put some over, I, I, and I know exactly who it was. Um, so the FAO, in spite of that, has come out and said, look, we know that livestock produces greenhouse gases, but livestock is the key to nutrition globally. We cannot cope without livestock. We cannot just reduce livestock. We cannot just stop grazing ruminants. That will be catastrophic globally and particularly in third world countries for nutrition. So as part of the sustainable development goals globally, we must have um, livestock within our systems and we need to work out how we're going to do that. This is a, a basically a cartoon of, of what's happening in our ruminants. And what's happening is they're taking in feed. So this is a rumen um, and a, a rumen has some, some liquid in it, a soup, 
It has a raft of the grass that the animal's eating or forage or whatever it's eating, and it has some gas. And all that's happening with the animal, it's a really, really simple system. It's evolved for about 40 million years in that the animal takes in complex starch like grass, can't break it down itself. It's got a soup of microbes in there and they break open the cell walls of the plant and they ferment it. And in doing so, they produce carbs for the animal. So they produce acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And all of these carb sources are slightly different in how the animal uses them. So acetate's the precursor for fat. Um, with propionate, we get more lean muscle. So depending on the bugs that sit in there, we'll get a slightly different fermentation and we'll get a slightly different composition of the animal. Whilst that's happening, the fermentation pathways give out gas. So this fermentation has got this off, off, and basically gas is being produced. It swells the room and it slows down fermentation and we've got to get rid of it. And hydrogen is combined with carbon and it's belched out as methane. It's, it's, it's a beautiful system, works really, really well. Those fermentation pathways are quite different. So propionate hardly, if, if at all, releases hydrogen, whereas acetate re releases lots of hydrogen. So um, what we know is that we can actually manipulate that pathway and produce less methane, but also that the animal itself has a set sort of, of microbes that are heritable, that are a function of the animal. So some animals have different fermentations naturally. They just naturally produce more propionate and less methane than others. Um, and, and our goal was, was to breed those animals, was to find them, select for them, um, and, and basically come up with a system where we, we've got a, a, a grazing ruminant that, that's producing less of the methane that's, that's causing this, this issue. Um, so the first cab off the rank was um, John McEwen, um, who you heard talking on the last slide, actually. And what he did 10 years ago was take a, a thousand animals from all across New Zealand, and he chose progeny test flocks and, and flocks um, that were really relevant to industry. And he took animals from each of those flocks and he measured them in respiration chambers. A respiration chamber is, is, is basically a really fancy box with lots of, lots of gas tubes on it. And an animal's put in there for 48 hours at a time. It's very intensive. It's hugely expensive to do. It took him years to get all the animals through. But what he did was he screened off the animals that produce less methane and the animals that produce more methane and he produced methane selection lines and they're still going. So 10 years later, they're still going strong. They're in their, in their third generation, really, really small flock, hundred ewes in the low line, hundred ewes in the high line. And every year we breed the lows to the lows and the highs to the highs and they're getting wider and wider and wider apart. Um, so what, what we're basically seeing now is that the whole flock is around about 12% different in methane, but the lambs that are hitting the ground, the lambs that hit the ground this year, uh, the low lambs were around 18% lower than, than, than the high lambs. So that gives us a resource. We know that it's inherited. We know it gets passed on to the next generation. Um, we can see it happening and we can test those lines. We can look at the differences between the lambs that hit the ground um, and, and we can basically see what's going on and one of the most important Suzanne, things that we've just, done I've, is sorry i've just got a question there Suzanne, while you're on that yep. slide um just asking were there other trades selected for in that or was it purely just methane no we purely select in the in the methane selection lines for methane alone so we don't select for anything else but probably the most important thing that i can say about that is that methane is produced proportional to the amount that the animal eats so if you have a small animal or an animal not eating very much it will of course produce less methane so one of the most important things for us is that we didn't just select smaller sheep that would have been really stupid so what we do is we select on the amount of methane produced per kilogram of dry matter intake so um, we, it's a trait that we call methane yield so we don't want them to just produce less methane we want them to eat the same to, to produce less methane for the same amount of food that they eat. Um, and, and that's what we've been selecting for. And we started off selecting on, on, on pellets um, in, in respiration chambers, which um, 
we were concerned that it wasn't the same trait as, as animals out on grass. Uh, so what we did was basically brought some animals back in. And over the course of a year, we had 48 rams that we brought in uh, periodically, put them through the respiration chambers again and fed, cut and carry grass. And we saw the same results in, in, in these ram lambs. We basically saw that the trait is the same at grass as it is on pellets. And that was a really important step forward. Um, for, for us because it showed us that what we were doing and what we were selecting for was producing less methane out at pasture whilst grazing. Um, and I would deny anyone, you know, the, the, if, 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 you, if you go into the, the field, you just can't see the difference between these animals, um, basically. Um, so um, what we then needed to do was think, okay, we can't spot, we can't spot the animal in the paddock. So the lower and the highs are grazing quite cheerfully next to each other. They're all the same weight. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to know what's going on, but we do know that when we bring them in, we always see less methane, so what's happening? So what we did was we took the respiration chamber measurements, which they, they, those, those gas measures are taken every six minutes, and we studied them across the day, and we found the one hour in the day that's most predictive. And we said, right, we'll go with that one hour. And, and, and basically what happens is that um, an animal eats and then for an hour after eating, the data is all over the place. So um, whilst that animal is just digesting that first hour of feed, the data is all over the place. But actually after that, it settles really nicely and animals tend to rank the same throughout the day as long as you avoid that crazy period just after eating. So what we did was... Um, produce a really, really simple chamber. Uh, and it, we started off with a Perspex box and, and, and we, we actually um, got the idea from Australia. So they were first designed in Australia. So we got this really simple Perspex box. Uh, that This is the, the, the first trailer that, that, that we ever built down here um, on the bottom right. And those boxes sit on a water seal um, and you just pick them up, pop a sheep in, shut the lid. Uh, there's a valve on the top. The sheep sits in there for an hour. Um, and and the, the yellow box that you can see, um, Brooke here, our farm manager, using to, to measure methane, all it does is it sucks a sample out from the valve on, on the top of the box. So we open the valve, suck out a sample of air, and it tells us the parts per million of methane, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. So we know how much oxygen the sheep's used, how much carbon dioxide it's produced, and how much methane it's produced. And we do that for an hour. And then we convert that hour to daily methane. So then we know for each sheep that we've measured, it's daily methane production. Um, it doesn't give us an absolute measure of methane. It's not as good as a respiration chamber by any means, but it's perfectly good to rank them. So the, the ones that produce the most are always at the top and the ones that produce the least are always at the bottom. And for a breeding scheme, that's all we needed. Um, and what that meant was that we could get out onto our research farms and measure thousands of animals and have a really, really in-depth look at what was going on. So we looked at feed efficiency, we looked at reproductive traits, we cut them open, we looked at the rumen, we CT scanned them, um, we followed them through, through the meat plant, we looked at their, their, their meat quality, um, we took genomic assays, and we basically followed in detail for, for many years exactly what was going on in these sheep. And, and, and what we found was that um, the rumens are different. So there's, there's, there's sort of more denser papillae in, in the low methane sheep. Um, and there's a difference in, 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 it seems in volume. So the, the, it looks like the high methane sheep have bigger rumens. We always thought the low methane sheep had smaller rumens, which was quite alarmist, but it actually looks like it's the other way around. The high methane sheep have bigger rumens, which makes sense because you know, if they've got more gas in there. Um, in terms of feed, the low methane sheep seem to have a slightly different grazing habit in that they graze more often. So in a feed efficiency type scenario, they have more meals, uh, smaller meals, but more throughout the day. Whereas the, the high methane line tended to go grab a great big um, meal and sit and digest it somewhere for a few hours. Um, they grow more wool, which was a surprise, but um, must in some way be related to the fact that the biggest finding that was that the rumen um, microbes, so, so we took samples of the rumen microbes and we sequenced them. The rumen microbes are different. So I can take a sample, 
using a simple stomach tube, I can pull out sort of um, 10 mils of fluid, or we're down to one mil now, um, and take a sample from a sheep. Uh, I can run it across an assay, and I can predict how much methane she's going to produce by what's going on in the gut, by what sort of fermentation is being produced by these rumens. Uh, I can either take a direct assay of, the, of, the, of the, the VFAs, or I can look at the microbes. And either way, what I see is that the low methane animal has a different fermentation going on, and she's got more pro propionate, which, which we expect from biology. Um, and she tends to be leaner. She tends to have less fat, which, which, which ties in. So we tend to have um, a, a slightly higher carcass yield, yield on the lows. Um, and, and, and that's really shown in, in their maternal worth index. So what we have here is, is maternal worth. So that, that's our selection index. So that's our, our collection of, of traits. It's, it's in dollars. Um, this blue line um, is, the, is the average flock in, in New Zealand. Uh, the orange line is, is um, a research flock that's really high performing um, of about 750 ewes. Uh, the green line is the low methane sheep. So that's our line of, of low methane. And the, and the red line is our high methane sheep. Um, and we kept this quiet for a really, really long time because we were kind of worried it would be founder effects and we didn't want to give false hope. But it seems over the 10 years that, that, that it's, it's, it's still happening in that the low methane animal seems to be much more profitable than the high methane animal. Um, we get more lean growth um, um, and we tend to get better parasite resistance and we, and we get more wool. So there's, there's a few things that seem to be driving that profitability. Um, but most traits actually don't differ between the high and the low lines, but we are seeing a little bit more profitability. And I think it's, it, it, it's, it's that killing out percentage and, and, and that parasite resistance that we're seeing. So we, we had a good news story, uh, you know, it, it, it was looking good. And the next stage really was to say, well, okay, what happens if we go out into a high performance flock? What happens if we take our research flock and actually put our money where our mouth is and say, well, we've shown we can breed for low methane. So now we're going to take this flock that's been flying for years and we're going to add methane into the selection index. And this was terrifying for me because I hadn't taken on this flock that long before this happened. So I basically changed in the research flock um, what we were breeding for. I added methane into the index. So we predicted breeding values based on the first year of, of measuring the, the um, ram lambs in this um, flock. And we looked at, so there are 22 lines, genetic lines in this flock. We took each of the lines and we selected the best sun for each line. And we looked at the average production index. And what we found was that it was $36.65. So we thought, okay, we're gonna add methane. We're gonna add methane to the index and see how everything re-ranks. And they didn't actually re-rank that much. So I, was, I wasn't taking the top suns for production, but I was probably taking about the third top. Um, and I lost about a dollar in production overall, um, but I gained about a dollar because methane had a value. Um, so in general, I wasn't actually changing the profitability too much. But what I did see was that if I looked at the actual methane, that I expected to, to change in a generation, instead of gaining about 1.7% methane per generation, which we were doing, the prediction was that I would lose about 4%. So there's a 6% difference in the methane production based on inserting methane into my maternal index, and I'm not losing much production. So away we went, um, and to cut a long story short, we, we've seen it borne out. So that, that was in around about 27, 2018. Um, Production has kept going up in this flock. So these are real numbers. Um, and methane here, you can see it's zigzagged around for a while. It's coming down and it's coming down at around about 2% a year. So the theory worked. We've seen it in practice. We've got this research flock on the ground and, and, and we're continuing to look at it going forward. Um, and, and for me, that's a lot more relevant than a selection line, which is only selected for methane. So, Suzanne, can I just, there's just a question asking, you know, the maternal worth, is that a cross flock in that, or is it within the selection flock? It's cross flock, it's yeah, cross flock, yeah. it's, the, it's the national um, maternal worth index for the country. And there's um, enough so, genetic linkages in there then to actually predict. So, so what we do, what we do with our research flock is um, we take four, four rams a year um, and AI. 
to, for AI. So, so, so we go across all the, all the breeders in New Zealand and we pick animals that we bring into link. And one of the animals from the research flock goes into the national central progeny test. Um, so we, we have a, a few different ways of linking that flock to industry because it's this flock, it's absolutely crucial that it's linked nationally. You know, it has to be linked in, in order to really show um, that what we're doing has any sort of applicability. Yeah. Otherwise, it's another few years and actually saying, you know, well, well, we found this in research. Does it work in industry? And we don't want that. We, we want an industry flock. So um, that was the point in basically moving from the selection line flock, which is a research flock um, and, and is becoming increasingly unlinked because it's closed into an open flock where we're exchanging genetic material with other breeders on, on a regular basis. So we then thought about what this would look like as a national rollout. And we looked at genomic prediction. We knew that we couldn't get out and measure, at, you know, there are, there are 19 million ewes in New Zealand. We're, we're, we're not going to get out and measure every single animal. So it's going to have to be done by um, probably some form of genomic prediction. And we looked at the heritability and the accuracy of methane. We, we had a really good handle on it. And we figured for a training population in New Zealand, we were going to need around 10,000 genotypes to, to get an accuracy that was sensible for prediction predicting in the, in the national flock. So that was what we were tasked with really, was if we wanted a national rollout, we had to have a way to measure sufficient animals uh, for a training population. And we needed to make sure that those animals were genotyped. So we had to get out there and measure methane and genomics on 10,000 animals. So as we could offer it as, as a breeding value. Um, in terms of measurement, we did that using uh, portable chambers. So, you know, we started off with a Perspex box. Uh, we went to a Perspex box on a trailer. Then we moved inside to a shed. So this is the um, a portable accumulation chamber. And, and it's a bit fancier. So this, this thing here, we had to lift them up. This trailer had to be level for there to be a complete seal because it's a water seal, which can take a couple of hours. It can be very frustrating. Um, we blew the gas out with a leaf blower once the sheep had left. So lot, lots of issues with, with these boxes. Then the next model up had um, a door that opened and closed, which was a big luxury, um, a pressure gauge on the top, a, a manometer, uh, a, a, a system that we could extract all the gas so we could exchange all the gas and, and, and really something that you know started to be really useful and one person could operate in the wool shed and we put through around 100 a day in the wool shed. So the next step was to mount those newer chambers onto a trailer, um, which we did a few years ago. Um, and hit the road with that. And the final stage in our engineering process where we are at the moment is that we added a roof um, because when we started the process, we were going to the, um, the breeders who had big sheds, but in order to get out to 10,000 animals on farm, we needed to go to farms where they had much less infrastructure um, and doing this in the rain or, or, or in the you know, direct sunlight is not funny. Um, so, so this is where we ended up. We've got a, a genotyping platform um, that's reasonably low cost and is sufficiently dense enough to, for genomic prediction. And we've got a trail unit with um, chambers on that we can get you know, up any farm drive um, and, and, and we can do around 100 a day on farm. Um, and we've got a set of protocols to, to let people know how they can register, um, what, what sort of things they're going to need to do in order to measure their animals through that trailer. Um, the fact that animals need to be well fed, you can't put a starved animal in a chamber and expect to get a sensible measure. So they need to be on almost ad lib intake uh, for, for, um, for two days prior to being measured. And we don't want any major events going on for two weeks prior. If you shear an animal, its feed intake goes up. So its methane is gonna go up. So you don't wanna shear it and then throw it into a, a chamber and expect to get a sensible um, answer. So, um, so that's, that's where we were at that stage. We'd proven it in research. We were comfortable. We were confident that we weren't doing anything, you know, weren't going to do anybody any harm. Uh, and, and we were going out on farm to genotype and to measure. And I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm just going to give you two minutes of silence from me. It's playing. It's good. Perfect. 
So this is just the trailer in action. I thought you might like to see actually what happens and the guy's actually doing some work. We can hear the audio on it, Suzanne, but we can see it, so. Oh, okay, okay, great, okay. So um, this is um, uh, Barry Van Vliet. He, he's our um, senior technician, uh, and, uh, and Janine Wing is, um, she, she used to be a senior technician, but actually she uh, jumped shift and, and um, works for, for Palmu Farms, and they're measuring some Palmu sheep. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's a pretty straightforward operation. Um, we're bringing sheep in, we're, we're shutting them in these chambers for um, a single hour. And this yellow box that we've got at the bottom of the screen, um, that's the, it's, a, it's an Eagle 2 monitor, and, and that's basically what's taking those samples of gas. Um, and it's, a, it's simply bring, bring the sheep on, put them in for an hour and release them. Um, and that's, that's, that's their job done for a lifetime, basically. Uh, we get a lifetime ranking from that measure. Um, we keep it all reasonably calm, and uh, thus far we've um, we've been going great guns with this trailer. This is the trailer before we put the roof on, um, and these sort of sticky uppy things that you can see they're manometers, and they're basically just um, showing us um, that there's a seal on the on the chamber and that there's no gas leaking from somewhere. Suzanne, if if those sheep put them at an older age, i.e., every year of their lifetime, would the ranking stay the same? They would. So what we did was um, in the research flock, we took lambs and then we followed them through as hoggets and as ewes. And we found that actually there was um, a 95% correlation between the measures we'd taken as a lamb and the measure that we'd taken either, either as, as, as hoggets or yearlings um, and as ewes. So at that stage, we, we basically said, look, we only need to measure an animal once in its lifetime. Um, we started off measuring animals twice, which is what we'd done with the respiration chambers. So we measured them once and then we drove the trailer around to a different farm. And then two weeks later, we came back and re-measured them. Um, it was an awful palaver. But after, I think, maybe three years, uh, we looked at the data and realized that actually if we measured just a few more animals the first time per sire, we could get away with going back. And, 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 and that, that was huge. That was so, so we made all these incremental steps, you know, as, as we've had more discoveries, we've managed to apply them and just, just streamlining get, get, get more and more efficient. It's been, it's been a long journey, um, but this is where we are at the moment. So um, a, a farmer applies to have um, animals measured and we turn up, measure the um, animals. Um, we're doing it in conjunction with Beef and Lamb New Zealand Genetics. So we put the, the data from the trailer straight into the national database um, through a bureau and, and they get their breeding values for methane alongside all their other breeding values. We don't deliver the breeding values. They're delivered through Beef and Lamb Genetics with all of the other breeding values. And that was really important for us. You know, it had to be simple and it had to be straightforward and, and, and align with everything else that breeders were doing. We, we didn't want to create a, a separate system. So um, at the moment, they only get a breeding value for methane. They don't get methane per unit of feed intake. And that's because if you put it into a selection index, we didn't want double counting. Um, so at the moment, farmers get or breeders get, get, get a breeding value for methane that they have to look at that and look at their production index and combine the two and we're working towards what what a sort of separate breeding value might look like uh, in terms of how we're going to get a, um, a breeding value of methane per unit of, of feed intake when we don't measure feed intake um, so so that, that that's what it's looking at the moment and, and and this is the progress that was made so in 2017 we were just measuring the research flocks in 2018 we got the new pack trailer um, and in 2019, so these are flocks, each, each bar is a flock and the height of the, the bar is the number of animals that have been measured. So um, the first three bars are the, are the research flocks um, and, and we measure sort of between two and 500 animals in each flock. 
In 2019, a bunch of breeders came on board and they paid for it themselves. They invested money and, and they measured some of their animals. Um, at the end of 2019, the government said, OK, we can see this is working. Uh, and actually, Beef and Lamb came to us and said, look, we, get, we can see that people are, you know, investing. We will invest 50 percent. So if someone pays for half of their measures, we'll pay for the other half. And, and that, that gave us a flurry of activity in 2020. Um, at the end of 2020, we went to this single measure. So before that, we were doing two measures per farm. So um, breeders were paying for two measures. Um, so they went from paying from one measure and the government paying for the other measure to paying for half a measure because we went to a single measure. Uh, so in 2021, we measured around 5,000 animals. Last year, it was more like 8,000. This year, I think it will be more like 11,000. So we're well past that training data set um, that we were aiming for. And um, the government has, has actually just come forward and, 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 and come up with, with more funding, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. So, so as you can see, it, it took a few years, uh, but we're now at the stage where um, we've, we've got two trailers um, uh, just about to be delivered. So we'll be running three trailers uh, throughout New Zealand. And this is what the breeding values look like. And, and this is something that, that um, was really interesting to me. I'm constantly being approached by people and saying, is it a breed effect? Um, you know, um, I, I want to check my breed. But what we've seen is that in every breed and in every flock, there's variation. So everywhere we go, there are lows and there are highs grazing happily together in the paddock and you wouldn't tell them apart. Um, and most breeders can look down through their, their ram list and in, in that sort of top five or 10 rams, there'll be high producers and there'll be low producers. So it's not a big reach for them to take the lows you know, and, and to present methane breeding values and to say, okay, so um, we're gonna start including this in, in our selection criteria. Um, and the breeding values range from around one and a half grams a day to above to one and a half grams a day below below the mean. Um, so we're seeing about a 10, 10, 10 to 15% um, spread. So, you know, the variation is there and, and it's there to be picked up and it's there to be harvested. But one of the things that we're really anxious about is, is so what? Somebody's bred for low methane and they have this breeding value. How on earth are we going to value that? Um, and, and in New Zealand from 2025, farmers are going to be charged for every kilo of methane. So we have a split gas approach here and um, the government has decided to split off carbon dioxide and to split off methane and methane is going to be charged for. And sheep em a sheep emits about 13 kilos of methane a year. And at the moment, the charges haven't quite been decided, but they're thinking about 11 to 35 cents a kilo. So if you want that in pans, basically just half everything. Um, so that's about six pence to you know about, about 19 pence a, a kilo um, but the average flock size is around 3,000 ewes so um, it may be a small amount per kilo of methane but in actual fact the the financial implication is big so at the moment it looks as though what will happen is that we'll be taxed at source so when you when you sell animals for meat you'll, you'll get a tax but then you'll be able to have a farm environmental plan and everyone has to have a farm environmental plan. And when you show ways that you have um, saved carbon, you'll get a rebate. And that rebate is going to be much higher per kilo on, on what you're going to be taxed. Um, there's, there's, there's talk about up, up to tenfold. So there's gonna be incentives to um, save carbon and there's gonna be a tax to produce it or to produce methane. But back to the BVs, we, we need them to be able to contribute to this environmental plan and to those calculations. So um, what we've put forward is that the breeding values are expressed as a percentage. So um, if your RAM team on your farm uh, has um, a, a methane breeding value um, or an average methane breeding value, that's 90% of the average um, nationally, um, that 10% is used for you to claim your rebate. Um, and that's auditable, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively straightforward. You can just, um, I say just, we all know that it's not just, but, but you would be able to prove using genomics um, that these rams are the rams that you've used in, in your flock um, and that you are producing less methane um, per unit of feed intake than, than somebody who isn't, isn't selecting for it. 
Um, and that's the part that we're working on now. And that's the really crucial bit, actually, because if we don't get those calculations in and it's not part of the farm environmental plan, then probably everything that we've done, you know, or, or, although we know that we're, we're, we're contributing to less warming on the planet, um, we won't get any sort of financial compensation for it. And in terms so, of... Suzanne, sorry, just before we move on, there was one question of, is there any trade-offs with reduced methane and CO2? Does the reduction in methane have any impact on the CO2 or not? As far as you're aware um I'll, I'll 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 talk a little bit about that later and then okay, if we'll i haven't answered it. the question we'll come back to it okay. um, but ask me at the end if i didn't answer it please um so um we're now at the stage where we are trying to show national impact uh we we, we talked to the government and said well look if you invest uh to phenotype 5,000 ram lambs a year which is about five percent of the breeding tier um, and, and, and we genotype them, but also we, we do a high density um, scan um, of 600,000 markers on, on the key industry sires that, that, that come into the system each year. Um, we think that breeders will adopt genotyping at, at around about 10% per year. So at the moment, it's around 30% adoption. Um, we'll catch the benefits being passed on to commercial lambs and the commercial farmer who buys those rams and, 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 and we'll estimate what, what it looks like in, in, the, in the commercial tier. So we assume a half percent reduction in methane emissions per year um, on a commercial farm. We know we can get much higher in the research flocks, but we think that half percent is a sane and sensible prediction with no effect on production. Um, full adoption in, in, in year eight. Uh, phenotyping costs, so it costs 40, 40 New Zealand dollars to uh, measure an animal through, through, through the pet chambers. Uh, so about 20 pounds an animal. Genotyping costs, we have a 60K here and, and it's 26 New Zealand dollars. So about 13 pounds for genotyping. Um, no money coming in until year eight because you know we, we're basically, um, we have a lag phase where if you breed something, you have to wait a couple of generations before it comes through um, and no change in the trait because of that until year six. And we looked at different global warming potential um, valuations of, of, of carbon. So I'm going to say something about that really quickly before I before I go on to national impact because it confuses a lot of people um, around what what on earth GWP what GWP 100 you hear bandied around and then you hear GWP warming equivalent and GWP star GWP stands for global warming potential and what what governments around the world have done is they've set carbon dioxide which is released from fossil fuels as the base. So when you burn fossil fuels, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere and it stays for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So um, it's here to stay. Methane, on the other hand, is a cycle. So methane is released. Um, it's released by the animal into the atmosphere. Now, when it gets into the atmosphere, it's a really, really potent greenhouse gas. So it traps more heat than carbon dioxide does. So it has a higher... Um, global warming potential, but it only stays in the atmosphere for around 12 years and, th and then it goes around the cycle again. So there's this sort of um, trade-off between the fact that it's much more potent than CO2, but, but it's much shorter lived. GWP 100 says, if I release um, a, an amount of CO2 into the atmosphere for 100 years and the same amount of methane, what's the difference in global warming potential? And basically what the governments around the world are, um, are using is around 28 to 30 times more warming potential from methane than carbon dioxide. So that, that, that's what they've, they've set all their figures on. There should have been another, oh, there it is. But there's a big debate going on all over the world at the moment as to whether that actually overstates the warming potential of methane because, and this dotted line in this graph here, basically shows um, these are, these are uh, this is warming from historic emissions. So um, uh, CO2 has been, this, the, the, the sort of burgundy color CO2 has been emitted. And then if we stopped emitting it in 2020, um, this is the, the, the warming it would do. It would basically stay constant because it's going nowhere. Same with nitrous oxide. But all the methane that we've emitted, which is causing a huge amount of warming, if we stopped now, it would go down very, very, very quickly. So that, that tells us, one, methane may not be warming as much as we thought it would be. 
but also tells us that if we reduce methane, we can actually have a huge impact on the environment very quickly. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but I, and I'm not advocating for either measure. GWP 100 is the metric that's been used. Globally, it's probably here to stay because to change it would be really, really hard. Um, but all I'm saying is that the governments have basically these, these global warming potential um, metrics and we don't really care because what we're trying to do is reduce methane by a set percentage. So that doesn't affect what we're doing. It does affect how it's valued. Um, and, and, and what we've done is say, okay, if we reduce methane by half a percent per year on commercial farms across New Zealand, what would it look like if we started in 2020? Um, and as you can see, nothing happens until, 20, until 2028. Uh, it's pretty slow until 2030. So it's not really helping with our 2030 targets, about 2% reduction. But then as we've seen with all breeding schemes all around the world for anything we've ever selected for, because it's cumulative, it ramps up. Um, and by 2040, we've, we've, you know, um, we've basically reduced a hell of a lot of carbon um, just by that, five, that, by that half percent reduction on, on our sheep farms. And then the most important thing that we could say to government was it only cost $1.72 a tonne of CO2. So it's a really cheap way of mitigating carbon. So that was an encouragement to the government to say, look, we can do something with genetics. It may be slow but the impact is big over time. And if you invest in it, you will get a really, really good return on your money, regardless of how you account for it. Um, and, and lo and behold, we now have the Cool Sheep Program. Um, this is Mark Aspen. Uh, Mark Aspen was involved in uh, industry funding that underpinned our entire program for the last 10 years. Uh, and, and he's now running an, an industry program where the government have come forward and they've given uh, funding to Beef and Lamb New Zealand Genetics, our levy pay paying board, well, our levy board, sorry, who we pay levies to, to subsidise methane in the industry. Um, so they're going to be paying for at least 5,000 measures every year for the next three years, and they're going to be helping to genotype that, that top side here. Um, and we're working with them to develop the right BV for the selection indices and, 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 the, and the calculators. So it's looking good. Um, it's looking positive. Um, uh, the breeders are on board, people are engaged, uh, and it looks like a tool, tool that, that, that we can use. Um, and I'm going to do one of those terrible things I say, but wait, there's more. Um, we're always moving forward. We're always trying to think of ways, ways to do things better. Um, and, and we've been measuring methane for, um, as I say, a few years on these trailers. And it's not always easy to get to every farm and it's not always easy to do the numbers of animals that we want to do. So one of the things that we've been looking at are, the, are these, these, these rumen samples. This, we've, we've been stomach tubing animals as we measure on, on, on the chambers and we've got several thousand of these, um, of these measures. Um, and, what, and what we've basically done is go back to our first principles and say, if we take a, a, a microbial measure um, on farm, which just takes two minutes. So, you know, you, you put a sheep in the trailer, it takes an hour, but you can, well, probably under a minute, you can, you can get a, a sample from a sheep um, and, and put it through the lab. So which is the better predictor? Um, and we've, we've developed a whole bunch of lab protocols. One of the reasons we're really interested in this is because it doesn't just work in sheep, it works in cattle too. And I'm sure many of you are aware that, you know, sheep are a problem, but cattle are a bigger one. So this is us on farm in a wool shed, taking a sample from a stomach tube, pipetting it into a tube, and then it goes onto the sequencer. And basically what we've seen is that little sample that's taken from a stomach tube is just as accurate for predicting a BV as a direct measure of methane using the, the, the packed portable accumulation chambers on, on, on the trailer. And it's just as accurate as using a chip, so genomic prediction. So um, we're basically in the stage of trying to commercially roll that out too. So people have an alternative, so they can either measure their animals on the trailer or they can have a stomach tube. Um, but one of the things that we're really working hard on is whether we can use a buckle swab instead of, of sticking a tube down an animal's throat um, because um, a lot of people don't like the idea of that, uh, particularly consumers. Whereas a mouth swab 
that collects the microbial DNA that's you know um, in a, in a ruminating animal and gives us a prediction is 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 much easier to swallow for for um, general the general public. Um, and what we expect to do is combine the BVs. So some people can have animals measured on the trailer. Some people can have animals measured using the the swabs, um, and they all go into the same um, prediction. Um, and, you know, and, and, and breeding values, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter basically which phenotype you used. So that's, that's pretty much where we are at the moment. Um, and we're also looking at if, if the microbes in the rumen are predictive of methane, but it's the fermentation change that's, that's where the action is, then that fermentation change actually is producing a slightly different fatty acid profile in our meat and our milk. And what we've seen is that if we look at the fatty acids that are present in meat and milk, well, there's also, there's a signature there for what's happening in the rumen. So um, holy grail for us is that herd tests come in or um, at slaughter, we can take a meat sample and get a methane BV and we never have to touch the animal. Um, so um, that's another program of work that, that, that we're heavily invested in. So always moving forward, always trying to find new phenotypes and, you know, and, 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 and new things. And I promise I'm going to stop talking within a couple of slides. But the other thing I wanted to talk about was other mitigation options. Breeding is slow and it may not do the full job. So um, in New Zealand, there are other strains of, of research. Um, we've got low methane feed, such as brassicas. We don't know what feeding level they should be at to make a difference, but we know that they reduce methane. Uh, we've got something that you'll hear um, bandied around 3NOP um, and seaweed. These are um, basically things that have been shown to reduce methane by big amounts, um, but you need to feed them. And most of them you need to feed either daily or twice daily. So not great for grazing ruminants, but certainly a tool in the toolbox. People have been working here on inhibitors for uh, grazing systems, and that's a bolus uh, that sits in the rumen and, and, and reduces an inhibitor slowly over the course of a few months um, and basically limits methane. We need to obviously to get the dose right. If you're putting a bolus in with something that's going to be released uh, slowly, there's, there's a lot of research going on in that area. And finally, vaccines. Very, very difficult. Um, you know, we were very lucky that a COVID vaccine could be developed overnight in in in, in most cases that can't be done. So this has been a 10 year program and it's still probably a few years away yet, but obviously a vaccine is something that could be used in, in ruminants in sheep, cattle, deer, and, and, and would be a one hit. So um, there's research in those areas. What we don't know is what the impact any of those tools would have on our low methane animals. We've got no idea, and, and there's, a, there's a term being traded around here called stackability. I have no idea if I take my low methane sheep and feed them a low methane crop, whether I get any difference, twice the difference. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know how those um, mitigation strategies are going to interact or stack up. But we want to use every tool in our box, obviously, on farm. So um, we have a project uh, called Minus 40 by 40. Uh, it's not funded yet, but we're, we're trying really, really hard to get funding where we take the research farm and we throw all the technologies that we know of um, at our sheep flock all at once. And, and we look at what happens. And we don't just look at the physical changes, um, but, but we also actually look at on-farm accounting and from a systems basis, you know, what, what happens and, and how we could wrap management um, around that. So, so that we really do know our numbers and, and, and we drive the conversation. And I will say my 15 year old daughter sat beside me on the sofa last night when I was flicking through these slides and she said, what is that ugly sheep? And I said, it's an all singing, all dancing sheep. And she said, well, it's very old because it's got an iPod. So I will find a new picture um, because I was yeah certainly put in my place last night. So summary, I said I'd stop talking. Breeding is extremely cost-effective way to produce methane, and we haven't seen any detrimental side effects to date. Um, we think that you can lower by around half to 1% in industry without impacting on production. Um, it needs to be an accountable and measurable method because it needs to go into these, um, these climate panel calculators because they're just counting noses at the moment. So we need to make sure that the work that we do is, is, is recognized. Um, and, and, and for us, in terms of implementation at the moment, we've got our cool sheet project 
where the government and, and beef and lamb are, are helping people by by paying for those measures. Um, we are trying to estimate how these breeding values should look in the calculators. We're working really hard on, on new proxies, new ways to measure methane and predict it. Um, and we really want to know the additivity of these strategies. And with that, I will stop. And um, oh, well, actually, I will say this is a global effort. Um, over the last few years, we have sent chambers to Norway. We have sent chambers to Ireland. Uh, we've got chambers going to Scotland. Um, and there's a, there's a group of researchers who are working really hard around the world together. Uh, so Uruguay's in our project, Turkey's in our project, working really, really hard. Uh, France, is, France is in there too, uh, to, to work together to make sure that we don't leave any stone unturned. So we're trying really hard not to compete in this in this kind of space in the, in this environmental space, but to collaborate and go as fast as we can. Um, and lots of people, obviously, um, attributed you know the the massive team and and lots of funding. So now now I promise I will stop. I'll stop sharing. So you can see me, although I can't see you, unfortunately. Thank you, Suzanne. That's really comprehensive, and and again, it just shows. Thank God John McEwen had the foresight, as he always does. And thank God you and your team have carried it on because it's really useful research work that companies like us and our industry over here can really work with. You've done a lot of the hard legwork and we're very fortunate to be able to actually ride on the back of that. So I think whenever people say, you know, um, Kiwi farmers and researchers are are effectively the competitors of the UK. This is a very good example where we work together and we can actually really help lamb in terms of its space on the shelf and its place on farms and, and the environment. So thank you very much for that. We've got a heap of questions, as you would imagine. Um, and thank you all for being patient with them. I really didn't want to stop Susanna in her flow because she was answering quite a few as we went along. So I, I will run through them, Susanna, just to... Just to um, deal with a few that we may not have um, covered. W one of them, since we finished off on some of the microbiomes, um, are you selecting for the microbiome, microbiome genetics rather than the sheep's genetics in the future, do you think, or not? So it seems that the sheep in somehow controls the, the microbes in her gut. So we are selecting the sheep that host the right fermentation so it, it seems and if you think about it obviously a sheep has to be able to control that symbiotic procedure because otherwise she'd be overwhelmed by microbes so there's something about the environment of the sheep that encourages a certain type of of of, of microbe mix we don't know what it is um we're, we're obviously you know fascinated and working really hard to try and find out but what we're doing is we're finding the 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 profile that we like that that fits and we're breeding for the sheep that hosts it we don't know how she's doing it we just know that we want her sure yeah no and, and i think obviously the whole microbiome area there's a huge amount of, of studies to do and um, it's in humans as well as in animals so watch this space i suppose with all of that really yep very much so um just just back down to a sort of um grassroots farming level we've got a few questions here um We've got one, for example, obviously somebody that's actually got some contacts in New Zealand, um, suggesting that there's a few in New Zealand that are seized on the smaller rumen um, that I'm worried that they won't do as well on sort of the hill country. Yeah, um, that, is that, that a claim or is that disproven? That scared everyone and it and and it scared us. And um, we did do some low quality feeding trials um, and we didn't see a difference. Um, we want to do more, but we have a, a, a really bright guy who has basically taken our rumen, all, all of our CT images, and he's cut out the rumen, and, and he's, he's looked at them in, in terms of low and high emitting, and, 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 and he's actually looked at some control animals. And what he has seen, and this is preliminary data, I only saw it three weeks ago, um, what he's basically seen is the lows look a lot more like the controls and the highs look bigger. Um, we were always worried that the lows, we, we knew that there was a difference between them. We, we, would, we were worried that the lows would have small rumens, but it's looking um, a bit more comforting at the moment that the lows look like an average sheep. 
and the highs look like they have big rumens, but that's we we you know we we need to do more work to to prove that. But it it has been a concern. I think probably the rumen's really plastic, and and it won't matter. But it's definitely something that we're aware of. Um, and one of the the research programs that that we're pushing to get underway is to feed low methane animals really really poor quality feed for for you know a long time. But in truth, these animals evolved you know in in the desert. We, we can't really feed them poor enough quality feed. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. And, and I suppose on the same vein, there's there's a question, you know, that um, breeders know their sheep. Um, are they happy with the low methane lines? And do they classify them as good sheep? Um, not just on their maternal worth. And, and similarly, there's a question, um, can farmers in New Zealand buy access low methane rams? And if so, what's the uptake like? So in other words, what's the commercial feel in the industry with it all? Yeah, so um, most traits you see no difference. So um, it's, it, although we see in the methane selection lines a, a much higher profit on, on the low animals, we're not getting any feedback from breeders that, you know, there's any, that they're picking their star sheep or, or that they're getting, getting rid of their star sheep. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's boringly neutral um, yeah. in actual fact. Um, in terms of low low methane genetics, we've been pretty careful. You know, we are we're developing technology for breeders. The last thing we want to do is compete with breeders, so we don't sell stock. It's not our job to flood the market with research stock. It's our job to create tools so that breeders can sell the stock that's that's useful for industry. So sometimes we share animals for linkage, but we only share for linkage. We're we're not out there competing with industry. Um, and in terms of you know, um, animals being available, as I've said, it looks, it looks from our perspective as though there are low methane animals segregating in every flock. So um, we would expect the change to happen pretty quickly. We're, we're not going to flood the market with, you know, a, a few animals of, of low methane genetics. No, but, but Kiwi stud breeders have been always very quick off the mark when they think there is a valuable trait, haven't they? You know, so yeah. they will adopt and they will mark it quite effectively, really. Yep, there was a there was a funding gap when the research was finished and, and we were sure that it would work. And, you know, we, we didn't have the money yet to, to roll it out to industry and breeders stepped in and plugged that gap. So that first year, a few key breeders came in and said, let's just do it. We'll pay for it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, the, and they changed it for everyone else. Um, so, so yeah, they, they, they really deserve the accolade, I think, because because they took just as big a risk, I think, as we did. Yeah, fine. Um, we've got a few, and I'm just trying to work through them in clusters so that we don't jump about too much. Um, we'll just stick on the breed for a, for a minute and, and the sort of the new market stuff. Um, we've had a question, does breed have an effect on methane results? But I think you've answered that already in terms of there's equal variation, but is there any breed differences? I think that's what that, that's asking, I think. Yeah, we we don't really see a lot of difference. So um, for a while, it looked as though Texel might be ahead, um, but I think that was maybe just because you get you, you've got that lean growth in Texel anyway. So maybe they have a a, a fermentation that lends itself, um, but it's it's pretty much evened up ac across all the breeds. Yeah. yeah, 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 and I think that's the the gist we've seen from some of the Irish work as well, really, in terms of that so um and then um on a similar could you mention gut content transfer does have you considered that at all does it work or not in terms of the microbiome elements yeah some some people have tried it and 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 the same in humans you know there's been the odd spectacular success but most fail so um, because it seems that the animal is in control of, of, of what happens in a gut, it just reverts back to, 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 you know, the host. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And on the same sort of biological sort of element, um, Emily here is worried that the key trade-off of the sheep would be the fat. Um, is, would there be a risk in maternal breeds where body conditions go, for example, key part of production and eating quality? Is there any trade-offs there as far as you're aware? Definitely something to keep an eye on. So um, we don't see a significant difference. Um, and it seems that there is, 
you know, the, the subcutaneous fat doesn't change as much as the, the, the intramuscular fat. So, but definitely something that, that I, we're keeping a watching brief on. It's something that we're concerned about. At the moment, we don't see difference in body condition score, um, but there is a trend towards um, lower body condition score in the lows, and we don't see any difference in lamb survival, which is the other thing we're keeping, a, you know, keeping an eye on. Um, so I think Emily's right to, you know, just be keeping an eye on it. Yeah, no, grand. And Stephen's asking, is there any genomic links, or genomic predictors yet, any gene-specific references or not? No, and I think it's because it's a really fundamental trait because it's evolved <laughs> for so many years that it's controlled by, you know, we, we know it's we know it's genomic because we can get a genomic prediction, but it seems that we need the whole genome to predict it. There's no one small area or one gene that's giving us the answer. It'd be great if it was a single gene, but no, we, we see very little in terms of large effects. Yeah, no, Grant, thank you. And, and Mark's got a, a raft of questions here, but I'll just summarise them into some of it, really. Um, Hi, Mark. <laughs> obviously, we were, um, obviously um, measuring methane, measuring Roman sample, feed efficiency, uh, we're, we're adding them effectively, stacking currently in your approach. Is there a cost-effective breakdown on any of them or not? You know, can, would you predict that there's one way to go or are we going to need all of them? So one of the things that we would really like to do is the pack chamber gives us a full suite of gases um, and total gas emitted from a sheep is an indication of her metabolic rate. Um, if we could use that as a prediction of feed intake and get feed efficiency and methane from the same measure, then we would be making strides ahead. So. At the moment, what we're really interested in is how can we get feed intake out of what we're already doing? And that the rumen microbiome is also actually really quite predictive of feed efficiency. So we've always got our eye on feed efficiency because feed costs are, are much bigger than anything else that, you know, that, that, that we deal with. So we are constantly trying to predict feed intake one, so we know methane per unit of feed intake, but two, because feed efficiency in our systems uh, it's, it's, it's a very heritable trait and it's something we really want to go after. So um, I want all of them, basically. I want them all and I want them all at once. And, that, and that's what I'm going for. I'm not giving up on any of them just yet. Thanks, Suzanne. And, and Mark's making some very valid points and clapping very hard that, that the presentation is even more compelling than what anybody expected. And very well done, Suzanne. So, oh, thank you so much. That. So there you go. Um, just pick up a few of the things. Um, uh, we've dealt with the trade-off, I think, on the on the on the CO two. Hopefully, Emily, that's answered your question because <laughs> I think in, in that whole element uh, there was a, a question to just explain what GWP stood for, um, and similarly, uh, was the alternative to GWP one hundred GWP star. So I'm not quite sure what either means, to be honest, if this is the answer. Yeah, so GWP100 is this warming potential that basically the government's saying that methane warms the environment over 100 years by about 28 times more than carbon yeah. dioxide does. GWP star or GWC, GWP warming equivalent, which are basically the same thing, say that actually um, it's about a three, it's threefold less than that. So um, they're quite different. One, one is saying you know, this is the warming potential and this is how we convert methane to carbon dioxide. And the other is saying, well, no, actually, methane isn't warming the environment by that much because it's it's being taken out of the environment after 12 years. So um, it's a battle that's going on with um, climatologists and the economists have got involved. And, you know, it's I'm not a climate expert, so I don't know which one the right one is. Um, but it's good to know that people are basically challenging and thinking about it and, and hopefully they'll come up with a, a, a reasonable solution. Yeah. Grant, um, very valid question here, which we haven't touched on, but but we know ourselves that is that is very pertinent, is what effects do internal parasites have on methane output? We haven't we we've seen very little 
in actual fact. Um, so we've got a um, researcher here, Catherine McRae, who's very, very interested in parasites. So, um, and, and we um, do a fecal egg challenge on all of our research animals. So, so we've measured them through that. Um, if an animal is parasitized and it's not eating very much and it's got poor thrift, it's not gonna produce much methane. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just basically that the animal is, is, is not, not eating, but outside the impact of not eating, um, we're not seeing any real impact from parasites on methane production. So anything that knocks, you know, intake is, is going to knock methane, but over and above that, we're not seeing an interaction. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think I'm just picking up a few loose ones here. Um, Peters was saying you can't see any difference in the paddock, but you can measure the differences on performance, which I think you've answered and, and, and said that you can see the differences in performance, obviously, but not that visible in the paddock. Um, and then uh, Clive up in Aberdeen, again, dwelling back on their ability to digest poor forage. Um, is that forage likely to have an impact on what's going on? And I think you've covered elements of that, Suzanne, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't seen um, them not cope with poor forage. As I say, I think when we think about sheep evolving to graze poor forage, they evolved on, on C4 grasses. And, and we just, you know, with, with the grass that we feed sheep in, in our systems, we would, I don't think we would ever get to that level. Um, you know, we're, we're not in the Middle East and, and, and you know, they're, they're, not, they're not grazing the Serengeti. So I, I, yeah. I don't honestly think that we'll ever hit that boundary, but obviously keeping a watching brief. Yeah. Um, I'm just going from the top. Uh, Mark was asking some questions about um, New Zealand policy, which I don't think probably is where, where your presentation is at in terms of where you're supplying meat and stuff for. So I'm going to dismiss that one. We'll answer another day, Mark. And the same with economics and ethics. Um, we'll um, pass on to that one. Um, yeah, although it, it is valid in that, um, you know, a lot of the breeders are coming to the table because they know that their markets are, are going to be aware of, of what they're doing. And if they do nothing, then there's a chance that, you know, there will be trade tariffs and they will deny themselves to markets. So it's, it's, it's a driver. Sure. And your meat companies, your processors are pushing quite hard, you know, Silver Fern and Alliance in various countries with their various, you know, carbon neutral yeah. meat. Yeah. And so that's already happening, obviously, and competing yeah. quite hard in, in that world market. The last thing we want to do is, is cut off market access. So, you know, it's, it's important for that alone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we're pretty much there. Um, there is a question I think you have covered in your slide, but it probably won't hurt again, Suzanne, just to how you're disseminating results to industry. You have a guide to farmers, and I saw you did put some of those in, but maybe just worth reiterating that. Uh, yep, yeah, so um, we've we've got a website where someone can go along and, and basically just look at um, the FAQs, but basically we... <clears throat> We take um, the measures, they go into the, the beef and lamb database and, 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 and breeding values come back. Um, we are constantly presenting to industry, presenting to breeder groups, you know, going out and talking to people, um, talking nationally. So it's, it's really a case of working with the, the entities that are already um, close to farmers and talking with farmers and just making sure that um, that that we stay honest. That all 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 our results, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly, are presented on, on a regular basis. So um, and we've done that right from the start. So you know we've taken people on the journey with us, and and I think that's really important. And that we don't shy away from you know things that we don't know. Yeah, and obviously government stepping up as they are currently. That's a very clear statement to the farming community, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a huge vote of confidence that you know we've we've done our due diligence. We've shown the biology, we've shown the economics, we've shown that it's feasible, and 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 that it's you know it's it's a useful mitigation. And in fact, it's the only mitigation strategy at the moment. Yeah. Um. So um. Yeah. The government have have, have, have stepped up and said, okay, um, we're going to support this now and 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 support it well. Yeah. 
And, and just as a last question, well, a statement really, uh, Mark here saying that, you know, the description of opportunity based on the variation of this trait is the most convincing thing and the UK must exploit this technology. Um, and probably just worth mentioning to the people on the call, um, Suzanne's already mentioned there is a, a set of pack chambers on the way up to Scotland. Um, we'll be there in a few weeks, I think. And, and obviously, um, the Scottish colleges up there will be looking to, to introduce them into where they can in terms of research and commercial application. Likewise, we have a set of pack chambers um, due to be uh, hitting the high seas end of March now and should be with us by, I would hope, May, June. Um, so again, we'll be instigating that as part of the Innovis breeding programme. And we're also in discussions with some of the Xlanas, the performance recorded cleans, um, Dorset, um, to actually try to instigate some of this in the UK to try and really move forward with it. So, and again, we're doing that very much on um, the brilliant work that Ag Research have done. Um, and we will be keeping very, very close um, links to actually make sure that we're not um, reinventing the wheel and, and that we're at the, at the forefront of it. So again, we thank you very much, Susanna, for that. Um, obviously, there are lots of things to, to consider and lots of extra things to come on board with it. Um, I would st stress to farmers, though, that um, there are some substantial gains you can make just in your production efficiency um, currently in terms of your, your systems. So things like your mature weight, um, things like replacement rates, things like reduction in lamb losses, longevity of your use, those are all key um, technical um, performance drivers that have a real big impact on the footprint of your flock. So whilst we develop and work with the direct methane measurements, um, there is lots of stuff you can do based on your current sort of breeding policies in trying to do that really. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just seeing if there's, there's a few come in, but I think uh, lots of, of people saying very good presentation um, and practically taking all of this on board. Um, and I think that's probably yes. Zana, so I'm, I'm happy to take queries or, or questions or, you know, um, afterwards and, um, any, anybody who, who, who gets on a plane, because we can get on a plane these days and, 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 and is in our neck of the woods, please come and visit us. Um, our doors are always open. So, you know, if, if, you, if you get a trip to New Zealand for a wedding or something, come and see us at the same time. Thank you, Zidane. And we'll obviously be in very close contact when these things are hitting our shores to make sure that we can get around the country and get these measurements working on them. Um, and uh, I think we're going to probably pull it to a close unless there's any specific, there's lots of statements here. Um, uh, Emily wants a trip to New Zealand again. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Great job. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, obviously, to Suzanne. That's really, really good, really applied, takes us through it in a logical way. So um, enjoy the Fridays as <laughs> before the weekend. So and uh, keep out of that bad weather. And thank you very much for everything. Awesome. Thanks, Dari. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, there will be a recording, obviously, for people um, that will be sent to you. Um, you'll also be able to see some of the other um, webinars that have been. So the last one we did was on ice split diseases. And again, some of those have a huge impact on your carbon footprint. Things like some of the iceberg diseases that cause severe wastage and production losses at your flock. You know, so there are layers of information here that you can access that will hopefully drive you towards um, a more efficient and a lower carbon footprint to your flock. So Suzanne, thank you very much. We're going to draw it to a close and um, have a good day. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Yes, bye-bye.